Gilmore, amazing author, speaker, communications expert, and an educator. He has been the show publicist for the Academy Awards, and he wrote this book with his co-author, whose name, I cannot say her last name. Dr. But I like Shirley Impelizari. Yeah, okay, Dr. Shirley. She's, and it's she's nine She's a great ways. psychologist, yeah. She's a, what kind of psychologist? She's a psychologist in okay. Beverly Hills. Nice. And nine ways to overcome your fears and captivate your audience. Before we get into the book, let's talk about you. At what point- My favorite you... subject, Julie. <laughs> yes, I know, your favorite subject. It should be so easy. Tell me how you got into speech and debate and at what age? Well, let's see. It was really around high school time. We had speech and drama. And I wandered into this class full of kind of weird kids, let's be honest, pretty weird kids, about 50 of the weirdest kids you'll ever meet. And Wait, I thought and to it myself- And together? It was speech and, it was speech well, and they drama? Well, they had a huge program. Our high school had a really big program. And so there were 50 or 60, maybe 70 people in our- In one class. Speech and drama, yeah. It was huge, wow. complete wow. weirdos. And I felt completely at home. I thought, these are my people. Here's yeah. my tribe. Yep, yeah. you and your beanies. That's right. And, and your crazy hair, your troll hair. Exactly. <laughs> well, so I, I didn't have great success at first, and that sort of bothered me, but you try and try and try. And we had a lot of kids who helped out, great coaches, and it went from there. And then I competed in high school and in college. And then I coached as a grad assistant at Arizona State while I was getting my master's degree. Amazing. So while you were in high school, were you, when you first started out, did you have a lot of fear? Like when you went and did your first speech tournament? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. How did you overcome that? How did you overcome that? Like, do you I was I was heavily that? medicated, Julie, even at that young age. Just no, you were remember. not. No, I was not. I should have been. I should have been <laughs> medicated. But, you know, it was, it was absolutely terrifying because you have to prepare a speech. Most of the speech categories, you prepare something ahead of time. And then you go to these tournaments. And you have to compete. And there are so many kids. And there are all tons of out. kids from all over the place. And they're like miniature adults. They're so together and so organized. And I was just sort of like flopsy mopsy. I was just kind of running around. And then you go into the room, you perform your speech, and a judge critiques you. Yep. And then you move on to another round and another round. And then if you do OK, then you, you break into the final rounds. Right. And, and so, did you have huge success right away, like right no, at the beginning? No, yeah. no, I didn't. It takes time, right? It takes it a lot of time. Story. Well, yeah. because there are rules, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm a good rule follower, usually. And I was going to follow the rules. And the rules are it's under 10 minutes, basically. Right. That's really what you're looking at. Or under 12 minutes, depending right. on where you compete. Mm -hmm. And the rules are in place for a reason, because you don't want some kid to go like 12 hours. Right. And you're sitting there like, I need to see lie. my family they again. They hear themselves. Exactly. So a lot of goes into the presentation itself. A lot of how do you stand? How do you gesture? How do you use your facial expressions? How do you use your voice? And luckily, I did okay. And it really changed my life. Amazing. So you were doing this all the way through high school. Would you attribute your success to your coach or was there somebody or did you do it with friends like yeah, it was all me julie it's all my natural ability okay the reason why i ask is because there are a lot of moms on here who would yeah. love their kids to do speech and debate yeah. you and i talked about this a few yeah. years back when i was trying to get my own daughter to do her first speech and she was freaking out and i had to get you on the phone with her and <laughs> I actually, did. Actually, we were talking about that this The morning. coaching session. Well, yes, a great coach makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Peers make a big difference. If you have some kids who are a little bit older, have some success, and they're willing to lend a hand and be encouraging, that can make a big difference. Right. But parents being supportive right. is everything. It's yeah. absolutely everything. Because it's terrifying. Julie, it's terrifying. Yeah, you can go on television and talk for hours. <laughs> Not everybody can do that. And I don't know if you were able to do that when you were a kid, right? It, it was always a dream, but no, I was so shy. I couldn't even go to my own family function and talk to family members. I was wow. that shy. Okay, 
So, so, that's so I get it. So that's not as atypical as it sounds, Julie. People are terrified of public speaking. And this was one well, outlet for me. And supposedly it is the number one fear in America, right? According to you and all of your research. Yeah. So public speaking is the number one fear in North America. That beats death. That beats divorce. That probably beats COVID. I don't know if the survey has been updated. <laughs> right. But it's terrifying for many reasons because we think, rightly so, that some people are going to judge us. Right. Or we feel like we don't have anything to say. Mm -hmm. That's a big thing. Yeah. Or what we have to say isn't that valuable. Right. And so a combination of these things can be pretty terrifying. Exactly. You know, a friend of mine called me a few weeks back and said, oh, my gosh, are you dying over quarantine and having to be quarantined? And I said, yeah, how are you doing? And she said, for us extroverts, this is complete hell. But yeah. for introverts, it's a dream come true, which I thought yeah. was really fascinating. Well, actually, I consider myself to be an introvert. No, you're not an introvert. I, I am an introvert because when I go outside, it takes a lot of effort. Does it? Yeah. Oh, definitely. And so when you I feel show... drained when I come back home. Okay, so as the show publicist for the Academy Awards, mm -hmm. surrounded by all of the celebrities in the universe, do you, do, you, do you get an adrenaline high or do you sort of freak out and want to get small? Talk about that. Well, it was my job. You know, I had a job as a publicist or I have a job going on television and that's what you do. And so that's a hat you wear. That's a part of who you are. Mm -hmm. And if I go on TV, if I am here talking to you, it's okay because I am doing a job. But if I were just to go to a party or invited to a big concert mm -hmm. where I didn't have a job, not so great. I don't, really? I don't function very well. So like if you're just invited to a party, an after Oscars party, just invited as a guest, what will happen? Or I mean, you'll, I know that you'll survive and you'll be awesome, but inside of you back in the day, would you like sort of be cringe? Scared? I would cringe. And uh, I don't go to a lot of parties. I, I went to the parasite party this year. Nice. And that was pretty awesome. I'm but sure. That, that was for personal reasons as well as professional right. reasons. But usually when it comes to parties, you know, Hollywood parties, I say no. I, I don't really go. I know. That's I know. amazing. So you could, I'm sure anybody here watching would love for you to pass on your ticket to them or your invitation. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't <laughs> or, know about that. Well, have you, have you thought room. about... Have you ever thought about taking a plus one who could help you and, and introduce you around? And does that help? Does her name begin with a J? <laughs> could it be Julie? Could it be you? <laughs> no, but I mean, is there such a thing? Like, I, I think there are a lot of people who are afraid to be in social settings, whether that's a large PTA meeting or a party or a parent function. So how, what, what would your advice be to them? Well, one of the things I talk about in communication coaching sessions or working with sales teams is mm -hmm. how to network if you're an introvert. How do you work a room if you're just terrified? Like, right. I'm terrified. Like, how do you make that happen? And so I want people to gamify it. You right. can make it a game. So one of the things you can do is if you have a friend with you, you can say, look, Whoever can meet three people from Alberta, Canada, in the next hour wins a beer. So you can make a game out of it. Or you can make a game for yourself. Like you've got to meet five new people with the middle name J right. before you can go home. So as soon as you gamify something, you make it a contest, it takes you out of that weird headspace that you right. can be in. So do you think a lot of people, what happens is they go and they think they're being judged. And so oh, yeah. they go up and say, hi, like, why am I saying hi? That person's going to think. See, perfect. the thing of it is, is, yeah, you're going to be judged, but not in the way you think, right. right? When you're in a mixer or you're in a social situation, people mm -hmm. don't want to be a jerk, right? right? Most people are not there to be an a-hole, right? right? They're there to meet other people. Hopefully. They're extroverts. They love hearing about other people's lives and right. getting to know people. So they're not going to be a jerk. So you have to assume that. And when it comes to public speaking, I always say the audience is on your side. The audience is not your enemy. 
we think they're judging you. They are, but not in the way most people think they are. In other words, they want you to be successful. Right, and right. The example they want I you use, to come off as confident and engaging. Well, of course, like who wants to watch some speaker who's flubbing away up there right. or has lost their train of thought? That is horrifying. If you've right. ever seen a speaker who just lost their train of thought in the middle of a the speech, they just blank. Right, right. Everybody in the audience is leaning forward, trying to make them say something, right? Like exactly. anything, like yeah. carrot, avocado, right. just say something, exactly. make us feel better. Right, right, right. So it's, it's horrifying. But also we want to be entertained. We want to be entertained. We want to be informed. We want, we don't want to waste our time. Right. So what would you say to those right now? Well, we're all quarantined. But those who are introverts and who are almost dreading that quarantine will end soon and that they'll have to go back to their jobs or their social lives or meeting up with friends in loud, annoying bars, what, how can they sort of, you know, build up their skills right now? Well, the good news is for introverts that this is not a light switch turning on. This is a dimmer switch going up. So gradually, yeah. our lives will come back to normal. Mm -hmm. And so this means uh, maybe a restaurant's going to open, but it's not that crowded. Right. Or maybe a right. gym's going to open, but for limited hours. So you can ease back into life mm -hmm. as we are easing back but into life together. Yes, that's a very good point. So for introverts, they can go at a comfortable pace for themselves. It's not like everything's going to just open up. That's right. That's it, and it, it won't. People, I right. think now... Look, we're talking right now on Instagram. People are doing Zoom meetings all the time. This is convenient. It's fun. Very convenient. Right? No traffic, you get, you get, no running No around. parking. You know, you don't have to wear pants. Like, yeah, there's so many wins, Thanks right? They're in the picture. Thank right. You. So I think the office life is going to change a little bit. Yeah. It, I think it will. And I think it has to. But people are going to get used to this, these Zoom meetings because, look, they're so dang convenient. And they could be done anywhere from at any time virtually. Exactly. All yeah. right. So going back to um, some of your tips here in this book. So for those of us who do have to give speeches, whether it be, you know, at a nonprofit organization that you're involved with at your church or for business and the dollars on the line, what is the most important thing that you would say to people? I mean, besides buying your book and reading the whole book, <laughs> what would be like the most important, valuable thing you think for everybody? Overriding everything is the idea that nerves are natural. Mm -hmm. Nerves are natural. Mm -hmm. So when we think we're going to give a speech, mm -hmm. we go into the fight or flight mode, which is a natural occurrence. Right. So don't think, oh, dang, I'm so nervous right now. You know, why am I so nervous? What's going on? Like, don't get caught up into that notion because it's natural. If you're not nervous, that's bad. That means something's not working up there right? Because our body doesn't know the difference between giving a speech and walk in, walking into a dark alley. It okay, just really but doesn't. but how do we overcome some of those nerves so we're not like so tense that we right. can't be authentic right. and that we're so in our head? One of the things that I recommend is to accept all those physiological changes that happen to you when you get nervous. So when I get nervous, my mouth goes really dry. So the first time I was on television, the second time, the third time, my mouth was so dry and I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to get through this segment? Right. But then I thought, well, Steve, don't be an idiot. Go get a lozenge because you know your mouth is gonna get dry. So don't beat yourself up because some physiological change is happening in your body. That's natural. Just fix it, just fix it. Give yourself a break, give yourself a break. The other thing is the preparation, people think, that over practicing or re over rehearsing is is not a good thing. You cannot over rehearse. You can't. It's absolutely impossible. And the third thing I always say is re write your speech to be said, not to be read. Mm -hmm. Most people sit down and they write their speech like an essay. Right. And then it just reads like an essay. Right. We don't talk like an essay. Right. It, yes. It's all jumbled. It's like it's, you know. It's, it's well, and then you have to practice it, right? You have to practice it out loud. Yeah, you have to practice a lot. And, a and lot. imagine somebody like you and I are talking. Like, 
engage, trying to engage them and imagine them nodding their head and really understanding what you're saying, as opposed to just going on and on and on and on. Yeah, right? Because that's absolutely. so Absolutely. And get up and do it. Mm -hmm. If you practice speech while you're sitting on the couch or on the toilet, that's not the same thing right. as getting up and actually delivering it. Right. I also say avoid the podiums. Avoid the podiums. Don't get caught into Don't the, get the attached podium to the syndrome. podium. That's no, because say, right? unless you're going to be carrying your own. To it and you might like yeah, fall on exactly. it. Exactly. You can't carry your own personal podium around in your car right. for every time you have to give up, get up and give a little speech. Yeah, right? That's right. So get used to your own body and knowing what that feels like. And it feels a little uncomfortable. And that's okay. Okay. And over the years, you have worked with so many celebrities and just about every single one. I mean, not just about, you've worked with every single one with the academies. Have you ever noticed that celebrities have fear sometimes or don't even like to work a room? Oh, absolutely. And how, we, yeah. in coaching them, in <clears throat> coaching some of them over the years, you know, what, what were some other ways that you found to help them? Well, look, Julie, actors are usually using a script but when they have to go out and give a speech or do an interview they have to be themselves right so you can be excellent in interpreting a script but getting up and having to talk as yourself that could be pretty daunting so that's one thing you have to always remember because we think look they can do anything they're a performer not necessarily true but also everybody gets nervous everybody so on the oscar red carpet when you're about to step out onto this 900 foot carpet with 1500 press people, the most famous people in the world yeah. on the carpet with you. Wow, that can be pretty overwhelming. Absolutely. That's nerve wracking. It should. If it's not nerve wracking, there's something clinically wrong with you, right? <laughs> there's something really messed up with you. And I've seen the biggest stars in the world, the biggest stars in the world who are terrified to walk out there. Wow. But everyone does it. Everybody does it. Right. Everybody does it. And so, okay, and going back to the speech and debate thing for kids and teens, and I know that speech and debate is starting younger and younger for kids. Do you think there's an age that's too young? In my opinion, no, not at all. Right. This, the sooner you get up to, and, and start performing and really understanding how to use your body and use your voice, the better off you are. Now, the caveat to that is when you're younger, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a good idea to make it about a contest or competition. Absolutely. I and think it should just be really like pure fun, right. pure fun. Right. So that, you know, they want to continue doing it. Right. 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 And okay. Now in you're high school, encouragement. but then there's high school. And kids, you know, in some ways get even more fearful about being up in front of everyone and being judged. What is your advice to parents about, okay, they know it's a good skill to have. You're going to have fear your whole life potentially over this because a lot of people do. And so we want to start them in high school, but they don't want to. Do we fight that or do we just let it go? I think one of the best things you can do as a parent is live by example. So if you're terrified of public speaking, if you're not gonna get up in church or temple or your PTA meeting because you're terrified and your kids see that, mm -hmm. that's sending the message that there's something to be really concerned about. That even mom and dad who are completely invincible and perfect, you're perfect for a little while, right? Until you're not. <laughs> not until, not until, in high school. In high school, until, 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 until you're not. You can't do and anything. Then, right. And then suddenly you're the devil. I know. So. But if you are demonstrating, if you are actually putting yourself in that position and they can see you being nervous and they can understand, hey, mom is actually processing this. She's a little scared right now. That's okay. And it's okay for them to be a little nervous and for them to be a little scared. But if you're the one who's like, oh, I can't do that. I can't do that. They're going to see that. Right. So I'd be very, very careful with that and use it to your advantage and push yourself if you're a parent push yourself. And even if it's not for you, if it can be for the good of your kids, think of it like that. And, and push yourself for an adult, they could just go ahead and jump on a TEDx, right? Like you just join a TEDx anywhere. Like it's well, not that easy. You have to you be know, invited. That, that was, um, 
that was an incredible experience because I was asked to do a TEDx a few years ago mm -hmm. and it's still a daunting experience. You know, it was the largest TEDx event in North America. I did not know that at the time, but the crowd is amazing. The event was amazing. It's TEDx Fargo in Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. And people were extraordinary and so warm and so supportive and a great time. And Okay, and so how did you prepare for that? I mean, you had to have jitters and, or did you have no idea that it would be as big of a crowd as it was? Well, I knew I it would be a big crowd, but I hadn't given a speech speech for a little while. So I'd written this book with Dr. Shirley right. and did pretty well. And so then I became this expert and I thought, my gosh, what if I get up there and I can't deliver what I'm teaching or what I'm writing about, that would be bad. Right. So that was in the back of my head because we all have these things that chatter back yes. and back. Yes. Head, right? yes, that doubt ourselves. And so what I did was I, I, I really sat down and I decided what, I, what do I wanna say at this point in my life? Mm -hmm. What is something that I want to communicate right now, knowing what I've known all of these years what I've experienced, the good, the bad, and the ugly, mm -hmm. and how best to communicate that. Because I don't think I'm a typical TEDx speaker. I have my own personal style, and that was important that I stuck to that. And, and fortunately, the, the organizers were cool with that. I think they trusted me, which I was really grateful for. Yeah, that's cool. And I'm a big storyteller, because I think stories are one of the most stunning and most way to educational with the audience it, it absolutely story, storytelling memorable. exactly so we we wrote about that in the book mm -hmm. and storytelling we've done it for years and years and years even before the history of writing right people were telling stories and they were passing along all kinds of things like morality like how should you behave morally or what things you should be scared of in life or how to be a good parent. Mm -hmm. So these were fairy tales. They were nursery rhymes. This is the way we pass on stories. So we're all right. able to process stories easily. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell stories. So I just told a series of stories. Amazing. So interesting. And that TEDx Fargo um, speech is actually on YouTube, right? Anybody? It is. It? Yeah. It is. So. If you want to see it, you can go to YouTube and just look up Steve Rohr. Understanding how we truly communicate can unlock the potential of human relationships. That's I right. I love that. Because That's absolutely true. As you said, and, and in any situation, whether it's in front of a crowd or with a friend or with somebody that you're meeting for the first time, right? It's yeah. about that relationship, the connection. It is. And, and Julie, can I give you an example? A real life example. Okay, so <laughs> men and women communicate differently. We know this. Yes. But even the way they gesture, the way they use eye contact, very different. So you can have some pretty gnarly, terrible situations if a female is communicating one way and a male is not reading it correctly. For example, <laughs> women, get this, it's all about nodding, N O D D, nodding. So women nod to show that they're listening. Men yeah. nod to show their agreement. <laughs> so if a woman is nodding and the man is thinking, oh, she agrees with me. So this is the scenario. You're, with, you're having a conversation about whether you're gonna go to your parents. Let's say it's going to his parents, okay? And you're nodding because you're listening. He's reading that as agreement. So the next morning, He's packing up the car and you're like, honey, what's going on? He's like, he, but last night we decided that we we're gonna go see my parents. No, we didn't. When did we decide that? Because he saw you nodding as agreement. You were just nodding because you were listening. Men don't nod to show that they're listening. They, they're very still usually. Right, right, right. Like a little dog. Right. <laughs> they just are trying to show you that we're listening, right? But women think we're not listening because we're not showing any reaction. Right. So that's why Absolutely. that's why women keep saying, Are you listening to me? You're not pay attention to me. Listen to me. Look at me. Pay attention to me. Look at me. They're li we're listening to you. But even that nodding is one thing where you probably had so many fights over the course of your 
your relationship based on nodding, which is crazy. But this is how it can unlock the potential of the human relationship. And that one very small example. Yep. That is a very, very good point. Yes. If men could just like raise their heads up and down more and make eye contact, everything would be so much better. That's there right. would be so many less fights in the world. That, yeah, because women use a lot of eye contact. Men, not so much. Right. They don't. They're and looking so, away and you're like, right. hello, are you deaf? And you're, and you're like, like, look at I'm me, right look here, at me, I look at me. Everything. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> the other thing is when you ask him what he's thinking about, he's not thinking about anything. Oh, I know. And then when you ask a question and you want an answer, you yeah. get, I don't know, I have to think about it. It's like, yeah. but weren't you thinking as I was asking yeah. it? How well, that's you? because by the time a man opens his mouth, he's already made a decision. Women will go survey everyone to make up their mind. They will talk to their yoga instructor, their sister, their mom, their auntie, the woman in the grocery store. They will survey everyone. And the husband is thinking, why does the, your hairstylist need to be in on this conversation? So when you are asking your husband to weigh in on a decision, he thinks you can't make up your mind and so goes into fix it mode and just tells you what to do, which is not the solution, right? right? Exactly. Yep. Or when he has made a decision, and he says something and then he doesn't listen to your opinion, you get really mad, right. but he's already made up his mind. So is this your next book? Like, Men are from Mars, women are from You know, Spain. I do these segments. 2020. Well, I do these segments in the US and Canada all the time based on communication and the foibles and the promises okay. of how it can work in your life. Well, and the next time we get on a call, I think we should talk about how you can tell a liar. Oh, yeah. How to you, spot you a liar. You have a whole like point on that. So good. I cannot wait. So good. This has been so much fun with you. Love seeing you here, Steve. You are Thank such you, a good friend. I appreciate you being here. For anybody who wants more on Steve Rohr, you can go to realsteverohr.com. And we loved having you with us today. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Julie. You're a good friend bye, too. Steve. Okay, bye-bye.